This video done been brought to you by Sunken Isles, a tropical, nautical, magical adventure designed by me. We've got less than 20 days left on the Kickstarter, which means there's only a few short weeks to hit some stretch goals and expand the adventure even further. So far, we've unlocked magic moonshine, adventure-specific character sheets, and an adventure hub that you can improve, defend, and customize the heck out of. There's some precious NPCs here that you gotta protect, and since there's no conventional economy in this distant land, we added a resource and crafting system, where you can forage for goods and either trade items or build them yourself ranging from basic equipment to entire buildings. On top of those mechanics, we have a whole new sailing system with simplified nautical combat, so you can jump straight into fighting ghost pirates, krakens, the ocean itself, and magical weather which we have tables for. Next up, or already unlocked, are magical tattoos that characters can earn and apply using traditional methods, providing them with unique effects and abilities. Check out the rest of the adventure, the races, the monsters, and more using the link below. Thanks for the support, and here's a video. Welcome to some of the most dangerous humanoids in any structured society, team building exercise, or functional story, whose overwhelming abilities rarely actually get used in D&D. That would be the doppelganger, and to an almost exact extent, the changelings. Before I jump into the topic of doppelgangers in a campaign, I do want to cover what a changeling is and the difference between the two. Both of these natural shapeshifters and face stealers have one or more fake identities and one original form. For changelings, their original design was a featureless androgynous humanoid with white hair. Then they became troll dolls and now they look like Apple's next project. Doppelgangers went from being caught blowing ghosts, to grandpa on a computer at 3am, to Martians, to... Wait a minute. That's the same lady. That's the same lady from one edition before. Hmm... Oh, and now they're wrinkly leather bag people. The major difference between the two races, aside from the fact that changelings come from Eberron, is that a changeling will create personalities and identities, where a doppelganger chooses to steal them because it takes less effort. The Eberron race, which is playable and thus more restricted, can't shrink to halfling size, can't read minds, and has a somewhat more established presence in the setting. Beyond that, for all intensive purposes, they are the same thing. They've had the same art, the same purpose in their setting, the same dispositions, and neither of them have real origins. It's also right here in the book. There's a wiki entry that suggests changelings came from breeding between doppelgangers and humans, but that's literally how you make a doppelganger. Instead of distant history, which is either hidden, forgotten, or never really mattered, let's go through the creation of single doppelgangers. Much like how you were made, it starts with a twinkle in your father's eye. Only your dad's eye doesn't have a natural pupil and he doesn't have a natural penis. I find it interesting that they only become males to procreate, and the reason behind it is probably their worst trait. Almost all doppelgangers are deadbeats. They arguably could become an average human mother. But then they'd have to wait nine months before drinking, and they gotta deal with a little jelly bean that pops out for the next however many years. They traditionally avoid all responsibility for other doppelgangers and the continuation of their own species, so they drop some doppelgoop into humans and then dip. A doppelganger child just grows up as a person, until puberty pulls a reverse ugly duckling and they become faceless nobodies with newfound identity crises. Like imagine growing up as Todd, the son of an alewife, and then when you pop your first boner, your dick vanishes no dick. along with your hair, your pimples, and everything else you've ever been self-conscious about. Naturally, they freak out and leave life to search for other doppelgangers. How they find them, I have no fucking clue. They quickly find they have the ability to read minds, the ability to clone features down to the poor, and a natural detachment from any real identity. So now we have another creature with infinite potential and a specific set of superpowers. Where Warforged can become anything, a doppelganger can become anyone. And the one motivating force they have is, um, hedonism. I mean, if you were nearly immune to consequences, blame, and permanence, and any friends you try to make don't trust you, of course you'd be out for yourself. Both Marvel's Mystique and Envy from Full Metal Alchemist are good examples of shape-shifting identity thieves who have no friends and a lot of pent-up emotion. 
The way that D&D avoids shattering every government and having body doubles snatch up every important NPC is just by overstating how lazy doppelgangers are. They have no motivation to take the world into the palm of their hands, especially when a handful of good coins and a golden ticket to Pound Town are always readily available. The instant a doppelganger sees a really hot dude, they can steal the genetic lottery ticket and get even more mileage out of it. I assume, from what I mentioned about doppelgangers seeking out others, is that they usually just don't find them. But rarely, a few of them will group together and pull long cons, slowly inserting themselves into positions at a single noble's estate or replacing a baroness and her advisors. That would actually be an insanely fun short adventure to run, having all your players be doppelgangers and then just copying the plot of Parasite. Since they're lazy, which is more akin to lacking motivation, they need a boss. If you want to give your players sleepless nights, have a small team of doppelgangers working under a mastermind. I ruined a campaign partly by employing one, where I had the villain steal a party member via polymorph, and then replaced him with the doppelganger. The doppelganger stayed quiet, waited till its shift during the night's watch, and then left. Yeah, a clever but reckless DM can delete an entire story with one or two doppelgangers in a single session. The original myth of doppelgangers, or fetches, isn't very different from banshees, or time travel paradoxes. If you see yourself out in the wild, and you're sure it wasn't a mirror, you better head straight to a testator and get your will written because- Honey, you've got a big storm coming. I think the best way to handle a doppelganger's introduction is as a corpse in the last place that your party expects them. Be it a prominent friend, foe, or figure, if they die and turn into a fake-out, whatever plot you had just went from apples and oranges to ogres and onions, because you have layers. The questions immediately start piling on. Why were they here? How long were they a doppelganger? Who were they really? And who sent them? That's basically doppelgangers.